it over to our second presenter today. Um, Stan Mahalik is at the Mine Safety and Health Administration, um, and he's going to present to us today on monitoring ground movements at mining operations. So Stan, um, you can go ahead and uh, take control of the, the um, screen, share your screen and your presentation, and I'm looking forward to hear what you have to say. All right, thank you, Steve. Let me make sure I get my slide up here. Seeing the presentation? Yeah, yep, we can see Good. it. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> okay. All right, thank you. Uh, this presentation is going to focus on how slope monitoring methods are used in the mining industry. It's going to be a lot of the methods that you may already be familiar with, but just another application. There's a lot of slope stability issues in mining. Uh, open pits create some of the highest man made rock slopes on Earth and those present uh, a wide range of slope stability hazards. This is a photograph of, a photograph of the Bingham Canyon mine in Utah. Uh, it's about 3,500 feet deep, and each of these benches that you see at this mine is about 75 foot high. So that gives you a sense for uh, the size of this pit. This is a copper mine, been in operation for over 100 years. So how do slopes present a hazard in the mining industry? Three ways. A hazard to personnel working down in the pit, as you can see on the, uh, the left slide and on the right. Uh, it's a hazard to multi-million dollar equipment that's working in the pit, and it's also a hazard to the ore reserves. In mining, you have to remove a lot of waste rock to get to the valuable ore. And if you have a pit slope failure that covers the ore, that now has to be removed and it changes the economics potentially of the whole project. A couple of examples of slope failures that have occurred in mining. This is a gold mine in Montana. And you can see on, on this photo how the failure is beginning to form and some of the dust coming up from the raveling that's occurred. And this, is, uh, this photo is after the slide has occurred. Millions of cubic yards of material the mine had time to withdraw the people out because of their monitoring. And during the talk, we'll show how that's used to allow them to predict when that might occur. This is a, a much smaller failure of a high wall or a pit slope at a coal mine in Wyoming. This is the Powder River Basin in northeastern Wyoming. And you can see how the, uh, the ground fell out of the slope. Much smaller volume, but still a hazard to the people working in the pit and equipment if you don't know that it's going to occur. Just for general interest, a lot of people in the East and especially Pennsylvania are familiar with coal seams, um, maybe five, six foot thick. This coal seam in the Powder River Basin is about 70 feet thick. It's enormous and provides coal to many power plants through the, the Midwest and Western. United States. Last example, a copper mine in Arizona. This shows how quickly a failure can occur. Even when slopes are being monitored, you can see how a, a haul truck and some maintenance, vehicle, maintenance vehicles were caught on the haul road when this failure occurred. So what are the slope monitoring methods used in mining? Uh, or I mean, why is slope monitoring done? I'm sorry. Number one is to detect movement and try to define the failure area. Number two, measure the displacement. And number three, use that displacement trend to make a prediction of how the slope is performing. The, the displacement trend can be uniform, decelerating, decelerating or accelerating. We'll see some uh, examples on some charts coming up. So what are the slope monitoring methods used in mining? Uh, similar to what you see anywhere uh, in the geotechnical industry. And from low to high tech, visual observation, crack monitors, wireline extensometers, surveying with prisms, slope stability radar, LIDAR, and INSAR. We're not going to talk about visual monitoring, what we usually call spotters, or most people call them witnesses because uh, they cannot react fast enough 
and notify the people down below uh, the potential failure area that a failure is occurring. So we'll talk a little bit about each of these other methods and how they're used. Crack monitoring, as a, as a slope begins to become unstable, cracks up on the crest will typically show up as the first thing. So monitoring these small cracks will give you an idea of what's going on. Uh, you're gonna be looking for, uh, is the crack continuing to open? Is it static? Uh, what changes are being made to the, to the ground? Uh, it could be as simple as laying two sticks across the crack, as you can see here. And trust me, these methods are used at some of the smaller mines, granted, but these methods are used and they're very effective before you bring out the big equipment. A little further up, a little more sophisticated than the two sticks, is the wireline extensometer. And, uh, it works in a similar fashion, except you're putting an anchor out on the failing ground, as you can see uh, to the left of this slide, and then a wire is attached back to an extensometer that monitors how the ground is moving. As the slope slides, it will pull that wire out. You can monitor the uh, rate and the amount of displacement. The nice thing about this is now we're getting into electronics and there can be a communication back to the mine office with warnings that uh, alert levels have been reached. So a little more sophisticated and, and uh, widely used in the mining industry. Even more sophisticated is in surveying with prisms, very precise. It's probably the most commonly and widely used slope monitoring method in mining. You can place as many prisms as you think you need on your slopes, and it can be monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week in most weather conditions. Um, heavy snow, heavy rain, fog may create some problems, just like in uh, everyday surveying, but uh, a very economical method, and that's why it's used. One problem with prism surveying is that once you start to have movement on your slope, it may be too hazardous for people to get out there and place additional prisms. But this is a good method if you have a, a area of your mine or your slope that you might expect problems to occur, you can get the prisms put on there before the, the, uh, the problems start and you can monitor it. This is where we start getting into more of the high tech, the slope stability radar. Uh, you see a slope stability radar unit here that's set up on a mine. And one of the good things about these units is that they're highly accurate and they can be set up very quickly. Uh, you don't need to do any additional work other than getting the unit set up on the mine property or your, below your slope. Slope stability radar, uh, very precise, can monitor up to three and a half kilometers. And like I said, it's very tactical uh, with its deployment and setup. Once a problem starts to develop, you can get the, uh, the, the radar unit out there and start surveying. <clears throat> How this slope stability radar works, you identify the scan area on your slope and it, it monitors, it scans that slope 24 seven and uh, just like uh, the uh, surveying, it measures the distance from the unit to the slope and back. And it compares new readings to previous readings and uh, will detect movements. The, uh, the chart on the bottom is a typical chart that you might see, and you can see where an alarm is set. Uh, once the movement exceeds your alarm, you get a warning of it. You can withdraw your people or your equipment, and you can see how this actually went to failure. Next on the technology list is LIDAR. We just saw a talk on that, light detection and ranging. Works very similar to surveying in that it uh, measures the distance from the instrument to the slope, and it compares new readings to previous readings. It can be done terrestrial, 
uh, by drone or uh, airplane. It, it can cover a very large area, just like the slope stability radar, and it's very accurate. One nice thing about LIDAR is that you can create a point cloud, as we saw. And that point cloud can be georeferenced so that you can take uh, very precise measurements off of it. And you can have even software that will monitor or analyze the data to identify uh, geologic discontinuities that may have, be of interest to your project. This is an example of a mine slope that was uh, scanned with a LIDAR unit. And this isn't a photograph, this is the 3D point cloud. So you can see it's very uh, high resolution and you can get a lot of information off of this. And once it's georeferenced, you can uh, take the measurements that you need and know exactly where you're at in space. Another example of a scanned, uh, more of a vertical high wall, where we might be looking for rock fall potentials or uh, mass instability due to a, a geologic discontinuity. Again, very precise and the, the discontinuities can be mapped. An example of how some of the software would identify features. Uh, down in the uh, lower left, you see a stereo net and um, you know, if you've ever had to do ge geologic mapping, it's a lot of work to get a lot of data points. With the LIDAR, you can get many more points and a more thorough analysis of your conditions. Last uh, method that I'll talk about is INSAR, which is satellite-based. Uh, satellites have been circling the Earth for quite some time and uh, have a lot of data collected works similar to slope stability surveying and LIDAR, measures the distance from the instrument to the ground, compares those readings over subsequent uh, passes, and uh, does a little calculation to determine what kind of movement is occurring. Uh, the nice thing about the, the INSAR uh, and the LIDAR, very little uh, equipment is needed on the ground, uh, none with the INSAR. Uh, with the LIDAR, you have to set up your instrument unless you're using aerial techniques, but very, uh, not very labor intensive to get the data. This is an example of a scan that was done at a, a coal mine failure that occurred in Utah. Uh, it was very large, uh, seven fatalities occurred because of this. It was so large that it was hard to determine where the actual collapse occurred in the mine. So a uh, INSAR scan was done to develop the uh, deformation profile on the surface. And from that, uh, contour maps of depressions or displacement were uh, developed, which allowed the investigators to find where exactly the collapse occurred. And again, very accurate. You can see the centimeter data. So some of the advantages, high precision, large area coverage, remote sensing, no ground instruments or site work needed, other than setting some uh, uh, reference points uh, for uh, coordinate systems. Uh, it's full site monitoring. Disadvantages, you have to wait for the satellite to pass your area, and that could be from two to 12 days. And the important thing is that this is a supplement, not a replacement for local monitoring. Uh, this is good to detect that movement is initiating, and then you put ground uh, personnel on the ground to take a closer look at it and set up uh, continuous monitoring if you need it. So what do we do with the slope data when we get it? Uh, just briefly go over that. This is a scan. Typically, it's a velocity versus time that we'll be looking at, and the velocity is the movement of the slope. The problem with that is that when do you decide when failure is being approached? When that velocity starts to pick up, but what velocity do you use as failure? We get around that by using the inverse velocity, and at least now you're approaching a known value. You can even predict when failure might occur. This is an example from a mine uh, out in the west, and you can see in the chart below the, uh, the 
the engineers predicted failure on November 2nd at 9.33. That's pretty bold to make a prediction down to the minute, but we'll see uh, how close they, they were. This is a slide on the left is the pre-failure. On the right, of course, is post-failure. The actual failure occurred on November 2nd, as predicted, only about 1 p.m. instead of 9.30 a.m. Plenty of time to get the people out of the pit and to move the valuable equipment. This is a real success story that we like to see. It, uh, it lets the mine stay in a production status for as long as is reasonably safe, and then applying an adequate factor of safety on the time, get everyone out of there before failure occurs. Another example of a copper mine in Utah, uh, this was monitored and they were able to withdraw uh, personnel and equipment before the failure occurred. And you can see that was a fairly massive failure right down onto the active workbench. Uh, final example is a gold mine in Nevada. The pit was evacuated 10 hours before failure. A little closer than we might like, but still a success story. So we've covered uh, slope stability monitoring methods in the mining industry. And uh, we've come a long way since the early days of mining with the cart and the mules. But uh, a lot of the bigger mines will be using the more advanced methods, but because they're becoming more available and very reasonable in cost, smaller mines are starting to use uh, even the slope stability radar, certainly the PRISM survey. So with that uh, ends my uh, presentation. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. And thank you. Thank you, Stan. Any pres uh, questions for Stan on his presentation today? Yeah, thanks. That's a good introduction coverage to kind of all the different technologies and things that are going on. A lot of stuff that I wasn't even necessarily aware of, too. So um, thank you for your time today, Stan. Steve, I had one question. Yeah. I was wondering, uh, you know, re regarding the open mines and the, the underground mines, you know, I assume the same technology applies, but are there additional challenges that you face when you're using this technology underground? No, well, yes and no. Uh, yes, in that you are limited in, in what you're scanning. If you aim the instrument straight down the entry or the tunnel, you're getting essentially the, the perimeter. If you aim it at a straight at a face, then it's working just like on a slope. Uh, other than that, no problems. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Stan. Um, thanks for your presentation. One more question kind of popped into the chat down here. Um, just, you know, just on the, the cost, how much overall do the scanning, uh, scanning units cost? Um, would they be economically viable for the smaller scale mining operations? I'm assuming that it's starting to get that way. I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to that. As a regulator, we don't own the equipment, but we, you know, work with mine operators and when the work needs to be done, we instruct them that they should be doing that sort of monitoring and they'll go out and buy it. 